Warning, chlorine, sodium hypochlorite, and sodium chlorate are all highly oxidizing. Sodium hydroxide is very corrosive to skin. The electrolytic cell involves high currents, which may cause overheat and shock. Wear gloves when handling the electrolytic cell. Hi guys, here is Dr. MIH. Recently, I needed some sodium hypochlorite as an efficient oxidizer. Also, I wanted to make some chlorates for pyrotechnics. There are several ways of doing this, but the most cost-efficient and the easiest method is the electrolysis method. Passing current through a chloride solution would yield hypochlorite at start and chlorates afterwards. As for all electrolysis experiments, we worry about the choice of the anodes. Obviously, MMO anodes are the best of the best since they are made for this process, but unfortunately, I don't have one on hand. Platinum ones, however, are very expensive, and they tend to corrode a little in chloride-based electrolytes. Manganese dioxide also work, but I haven't made it yet. So this leaves me two choices, either lead dioxide or graphite. For making hypochlorite and chlorates, we must choose a chloride salt to start with. I chose sodium chloride since it is, well, the cheapest, and I got it on hand. Potassium and calcium chloride would also work. Test 1. I weighted 60 grams of sodium chloride and dissolved it in about 400 milliliters of water. I then connected my lead dioxide anode and copper wire cathode with the 12 volt power supply. A lot of bubbles formed on the cathode, but the anode didn't show a single bubble. A while after, the solution turned turbid yellow and the lead dioxide started flaking off. I tested this again using a smaller cell and it showed the exact same result. Here is the supposed to be mechanism. So my lead anode keep flaking off lead dioxide and exposing fresh lead metal. In sulfate based baths, the lead metal does not move in the solution since lead sulfate is insoluble. Therefore, it quickly oxidizes to lead dioxide on the surface again. But in chloride based baths, lead moves into the solution as lead chloride, and this gradually consumes the lead metal. Conclusion, test one is a failure. Lead anodes cannot be used. Test two, I switched to graphite anodes this time. Note that my graphite wasn't in the common rod form. It is graphite paper. Here, the piece is 0.5 millimeters thick. Graphite paper behaves just like normal paper. It bends easily and can be cut into pieces with a scissor. However, it is much shinier than graphite rods. The cathode is plain sponge nickel. I connected the cell to the 12 volt power supply, and then I realized that something is going wrong. Due to the high current, 3 amps, as the ammeter shows, one of my alligator clips started emitting fumes. This is because the resistance at the touching point of the clip is very high, so it heats up easily. I swapped the alligator wire for another one. I tested the pH of the cell with some pH paper. At first, the paper showed a dark color, but it immediately faded away. The indicators in the pH paper were oxidized by the sodium hypochlorite, and then showed an orange color. I demonstrated this again, and the color changed just as quickly. This indicates that we have a sizable amount of sodium hypochlorite in the cell. Two days later, the cell turned much darker due to the graphite particles that release off the anode. There were also a lot of salt creep on the sides of the beakers. But still, the cell is running smoothly. As the electrolysis proceeds, the resistance of the solution decreases, so the current increases to a little more than 3 amps. I swapped out my old alligator clip for a homemade one, because as I said, it cannot handle large currents. The homemade clip is just a clip connected to household wires for electronics. After a week, I dismantled the cell and took out the electrodes. To my surprise, the graphite paper anode was only slightly corroded on the outside, and then it stopped corroding further. This is much better than the graphite rods, which keep corroding. Also, it was worth noting that the texture on the two sides of it was different. The side that was apart from the cathode showed less corrosion. Conclusion, test two was a complete success. 
Based on test two, I moved on to a quantitative preparation. I measured out 60 grams of sodium chloride and dissolves it in 200 milliliters of water. This took much effort since my magnetic stirrer was only working intermittently. I switched the foam nickel cathode for a graphite one because it kept falling apart and the cell seems to be going quite well. However, I realized after some time that the graphite cathode was having a ridiculous amount of corrosion and released a lot of graphite particles in the solution. I swapped it out for a copper wire cathode and I decided to modify the cell a bit. The cells before have the problems of corrosion, salt creep, and high resistance. I added a cardboard cap with PTFE tape on one side to the cell and punched some holes in it for the electrodes. I also used the alligator clips in a different way. It was no longer a part of the circuit. It just helps holding the copper wire directly to contact with the electrodes. In this way, we can minimize the resistance on the contact points. I left this setup running for a week, and according to my calculations, there should be no hypochlorite left, and the beaker should be full of sodium chloride. However, when I came back on the next week, the cell had stopped working. On further inspections, it was because the other cell connected to it in series failed. But anyways, I don't want to wait for another week, so I simply took apart the cell and started processing the chlorides. The electrodes seemed just as fine, and the PTFE cap was bleached slightly white by the hypochlorite, but that is also fine. There was a bunch of salt and graphite particles on the sides of the beaker, so I first washed them down with some water. I then filtered the mixture, and what came out was a clear yellow solution. I actually used two layers of filter paper for this, since I thought that the hypochlorite would just eat through them, but the filter papers seemed to work fine. I poured the filtrate into a beaker, and it was about 150 milliliters. I measured out 50 milliliters of the solution, and took accurate mass measurements. However, I accidentally spilled the solution on the table. Later, I was able to recover a portion using tissue papers, but unfortunately I lost about 30 milliliters of the solution. So I just did the measurement again, and this time I fortunately did not spill it. The mass of the solution was 59.67 grams, which corresponds with a density of 1.1934 grams per milliliter. I then put the beaker of the solution on the hot plate to warm it up a little. The next thing on the list is turning the sodium chloride in solution into potassium chloride by precipitating it out. For this, potassium chloride is needed, but I didn't have it on hand, so I chose to make it by the reaction between potassium carbonate and calcium chloride. I measured out 55.5 grams of anhydrous calcium chloride, which is about half a mole, and dissolved it in 80 milliliters of boiling water. The addition of anhydrous calcium chloride to water is extremely exothermic and caused the solution to boil. This actually further increases the solubility of the salt, which makes the dissolution very fast. In fact, I didn't even have to stir the solution to dissolve all of them. After all the calcium chloride had dissolved, the solution was turning a slight brown. This is probably because I used anhydrous calcium chloride instead of the ones with crystallized water. The dehydrating process may produce impurities such as calcium oxide. I attempted to filter off the impurities, but the filtrate was still kind of browned, so I just ignored it and proceeded on. Next, I measured out 69.13 grams, or half a mole, of anhydrous potassium carbonate, and dissolved it in 80 milliliters of boiling water as well. The dissolution of the salt was quite similar to calcium chloride, but not as vigorous. I still stirred the solution a little to dissolve the salt. The solution produced was crystal clear. I placed the two salt solutions on the hot plate to increase their temperature. I constantly monitored the temperature of the solutions using the digital thermometer. This step is vital because later, when we mix the solutions, potassium chloride is going to be produced. It doesn't have a very high solubility in water, 
And so the only way to keep it dissolved in this little amount of water is to keep the temperature above 80 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, the potassium chloride would simply precipitate out and waste our regions. This also means that we have to do the filtration very, very quickly, or else the temperature of the solution is going to drop below 80 degrees. Therefore, a vacuum filtration is mandatory. I waited until both the solutions were reaching 95 degrees Celsius. Now get ready. I first turned my vacuum pump on and then pour roughly equal amounts of calcium chloride in the two beakers. Since I didn't have another 250 milliliter beaker to contain everything, I have to do this in two portions. Then, roughly equal amounts of potassium carbonate are poured in the beakers. Notice that the precipitates that first formed was quite flocculent. This is totally different from the hard calcium carbonate precipitate that I was expecting. However, uh, after about 10 seconds of strong stirring, the fluffy stuff turned to the normal powder-like appearance of calcium carbonate. Sorry about that, I didn't capture this bit because, like, my camera literally ran out of power at that precise moment. After about 20 seconds of strong stirring in the two beakers, I transferred their contents to the funnel and filtered the mixture. The resulting calcium carbonate was perfectly white, just as the type we normally see in our daily lives. I used a little bit of water to wash the remaining potassium chloride off the calcium carbonate. You can see that there is actually a lump of solid material in the filtrate, along with some tiny crystals on the bottom. And that is actually the potassium chloride that precipitated out because the temperature was running low. On seeing this, I didn't wait anymore and quickly poured the potassium chloride solution into the electrolyte. A thick white precipitate formed immediately, and I was very delighted. Here, potassium chloride and sodium chloride react to produce sodium chloride and potassium chloride. And because the potassium chloride has a lower solubility in water than the other ingredients, it precipitates out. I poured out most of the filtrate and left the extra potassium chloride behind. I originally used an excess of the potassium carbonate and calcium chloride, so the potassium chloride is also in excess. I then reheated the solution trying to dissolve as much as the potassium chloride, and after a few minutes, I took it off the heat and waited it to cool down. At this point, I checked the remaining solution in the conical flask, and a large amount of potassium chloride had precipitated. I then attempted to recycle the calcium carbonate by washing it several times with water. I later tried to dry it, but until now it was still not completely dry. Anyways, after waiting several hours, our chloride solution had cooled to room temperature. There was about half the beaker's height of fluffy crystals settling at the bottom. I vacuum filtered the crystals out, but the filtering was extremely slow and I am running out of time. So I decided to remove most of the solution using the pump, pouring out the filtrate and left the rest of the crystals inside the funnel for a week. The filtrate that came through has a slight yellow tint, which resembles hypochlorite. It also contains extra potassium chloride, sodium chloride and potassium chlorate, which makes it the perfect raw material for another chloride cell. I simply set up the original electrolysis apparatus and let it run for another week. However, the chlorides produced seem to settle on the copper wire cathode and forming a hard non-permeable layer, and I cannot continue the electrolysis. I'm not very sure why is that, but I guess it's because the low solubility of potassium chloride making it precipitate, but that didn't seem to happen in the other YouTube videos that also did this. So if you guys have any ideas, please tell me in the comments. After the week, I removed the potassium chloride crystals from the funnel and weighted it. It was a surprisingly high 39 grams. However, I still have to dry them. So I transferred them to a piece of tissue paper and spread it out to dry. After a day, it still wasn't completely dry, so I got impatient and dumped it on the hot plate. After drying, I only got 13.27 grams of potassium chloride left, which means that there are a ton of water in the original mix. 
Additionally, some of the potassium chlorate was lost in the tissue paper. I will actually dry the tissue paper out and igniting it. It is probably going to produce a very, very high flame temperature, and it will be a spectacular event. 13.27 grams represents a yield of about 10.83%. But since the electrolysis was intermittent and did not last a whole week, I am still very satisfied with this result. After all, 13.27 grams is not bad on my first run with such a crude setup, and it is more than enough to do the projects that I planned. Anyways, the whole chloride project was a perfect success. See you next time!